Without much ado, I'll hand over to uh, Jeremy Main, who will be talking about um, computing infrastructure at the South African Radio Astronomy Observatory. Thank you. Thanks, Clement. And yeah, thanks, thanks everyone for joining physically and virtually. And if you're watching the recording as well, um, it'll, uh, you have the advantage of being able to fast forward in places. So it uh, might be a better experience. <laughs> thanks very much. So I, I was asked uh, last week to uh, give a report back at this conference on the uh, activities at Soraya. So Soraya is responsible for the hosting of the SK-1 mid-frequency radio telescope, which has uh, been hosted here in South Africa. Uh, what I'm going to do, uh, let's just start with the first slide. Um, just to sort of paint the picture, uh, my role within the organization, I'm the computing infrastructure group lead. I'm responsible for the cybersecurity networks, uh, the business IT, and the uh, server and storage infrastructure where there's a commonality across the organization. So it's, it's quite a, a, a broad role. Uh, this presentation wouldn't be possible without the input of very many uh, subject matter experts within the organization. Uh, Soraya is an organization of uh, around 450 staff. Um, almost more than half of that are, are engineers of some kind, civil, uh, electrical, electronics, um, mechanical, computer scientists, uh, uh, algorithm optimization programmers, hardware manufacturers, uh, quite a broad range of engineering capability. Uh, and, and in the disclaimer, I make it very clear that I'm not uh, neither an astronomer <laughs> nor an engineer. Um, so I'm presenting this information as a higher level. Um, and if you have detailed questions, my role will be to sort of connect you with the people who have that uh, deep expertise. It's a very siloed uh, type of structure within the engineering, but that's why we built what, what we have. So, so uh, just starting on the, um, on the acknowledgements, uh, I've had input from our chief scientist, our deputy MD, uh, our head of hosting, this is quite an important role, head of commercialization, uh, the current Meerkat Plus program manager, digital signal processing, the PMO, some of the project managers, uh, some input as well. And this is just to highlight this now, how to be a sort of radio astronomy is also part of the South African uh, Radio Astronomy Observatory. They were incorporated uh, in, in the last four years. Uh, and actually some of you'll see in the slides that some of the work that they did initially uh, was a very valuable uh, contribution towards uh, the Meerkat Radio Telescope and, of course, our communications department. So I've got this little mind map just to, to show you where, where I'm going to go. Um, it is kind of confusing even when you work in the organization who is who. So I'm spending a little bit of time on that. Um, but uh, at, at the start, uh, we, we built Meerkat, uh, and, and I'll show you how that came about. Um, and uh, that was a, uh, on the back of being awarded the, the construction rights to host the SK-1 in South Africa. So Meerkat was sort of providing evidence to the, the bidding consortium that South Africa had the infrastructure in place and the technology and the capability to deliver and support SK-1. And, and Meerkat would have happened regardless, but it was good evidence that uh, if you were going to host a big uh, radio astronomy instrument, that you would build your own one uh, as proof. And actually Meerkat becomes Escape uh, One Mid Radio Frequency Telescope. And then, uh, yeah, uh, a little bit of the details. Um, I'm quite keen to uh, get to the end actually and just show you some, some of the opportunities that are available within Sorrel as well. Uh, so there are, uh, this is also part of the explainer. There are a number of logos that are associated with our project. Uh, when the project initially started, uh, this was um, the, the, the logo and was designed by one of our scientists. Um, uh, they came up with it overnight and it kind of stuck for a very long time. Um, then at, at some point, um, the SKA sort of pulled its heart together as, a, as an organization, but they weren't uh, an intergovernmental organization at that point. It's almost like a, a, a consortium. And they used uh, this logo for a while. 
um, while we moved away from the SKA logo to the Sareo, so we rebranded as the South African Radio Astronomy Observatory, responsible for the SKA project. Um, then uh, what we have now is the intergovernmental organization was formed and it's now a, uh, like the UN, an intergovernmental organization that is made up of many national uh, members, international, uh, yeah, international foreign countries. And the co-branding, uh, this is the SK1 mid co-branding shows the relation that uh, Sarao is the host of the instrument and SKO is um, the, the actual mega science project. Um, Surrey or South Africa is a member of the SKO at a national level through the Department of Science and Innovation. So you know, while we're also hosting, we're also a member who are expecting return on investment uh, from the, the um, instrument itself. So where it began, um, I'm going to start with Dr. Bernie Fanaroff, um, who, who some might have, might have met. Uh, he is an astronomer. He was at the Witts University uh, for a while. And uh, during those uh, late years of apartheid, uh, joined the, the, the labor uh, unions and became a very active uh, political figure within government. And at the change in 1994, uh, was then a scientific advisor to the Nelson Mandela um, government. Now, this gave him a great opportunity to have the ear of very senior members in government. And when the government was looking around for what, does, what, what should South Africa do now, he, he had a solution. He said, we have an advantage here in South Africa um, in radio astronomy. We have the skills, the expertise, geographical advantage, and we should bid for, for the hosting. So Bernie himself uh, has got, I have to refer to my notes here. Um, He's, he, there are a couple of papers um, in radio astronomy. He's well known for a classification scheme of radio galaxies, actually called the Fanaroff Riley. Um, it's it's a, when they did all sky surveys, they could identify in radio frequency, radio uh, galaxies, and, and characterize them. It was named after him. So that's Bernie. On the technology side and the road towards where, where we are, um, th one of the key elements to the success, I guess, of the organization was the engineering approach that was adopted. A systems engineering approach using the simple systems engineering V model, if you've uh, heard about it, uh, basically starts with high level requirements, refined requirements, detail requirements. Um, then you start moving uh, from the concept and the requirements into an implementation, uh, into a verification phase, subsystem verification, and then to operations and maintenance. So it's a very a strict process that ensures that whatever was in the requirements is delivered in the product. Uh, the great advantage of this uh, is if something's never been built before, the only way to do it is like this. Uh, and you don't buy radio telescopes off the shelf, so you need you needed an approach. And that was what was used. The technological development started with a single dish XDM. This was hosted at Hot at the Biersport. Um, moved to CAT7, which was seven of those dishes. This was uh, uh, built in and operated. CAT, by the way, stands for Karoo Array Telescope. Uh, and then somebody clever said, well, if you're gonna build more of them, we must just call them Mirkat, uh, which kind of made sense. Uh, and it kind of does stand up a little bit in the field, uh, like the Mirkat. And, and the, the next evolution, and I'm gonna talk about this, is the SK, the technology that was engineered from scratch in, in um, the Mirka project is now informing and the, the SKA technology. Um, so just a quick thing about Hata uh, Biersuk radio astronomy. Um, they're probably most famous, I guess, for this 26 meter antenna, uh, which was used um, in the early days of the Apollo missions to support deep space communication. Um, and, you know, due to South Africa's um, involvement uh, or, or a political stance, the, they, they moved away and moved to a ground station that was based in Spain. Uh, but nonetheless, the, 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 yeah, this was in 1975, the, the technology remained um, for, for radio astronomy. And today, the 26 meter provides the South African datum, the Hart of Hook 94. If you use GPS, you'll be familiar with that datum. It grounds the WGS 84. <laughs> Uh, ellipsoid, which is used in your in your GPS um, models. 
Uh, and XTM was developed here using the technology and the expertise of people who, who were in the radio astronomy space at that time. Uh, so there's cut seven, that's four of the dishes. Uh, just to give you some specs, it's a 12 meter antenna, the frequency range between uh, 1.2 and, and nearly two gigahertz. And, and at this point, why use an array? Um, you might have seen in James Bond movies or other movies, the Arecibo dish, it's a single massive dish that just sits in the ground. Uh, it's it's uh, receiving signals from space and concentrating them on one receiver. Uh, through a process called interferometry, uh, it was discovered that uh, you can get the equivalent receiving area and, and uh, um, a geometric uh, visibility by having a distributed array of antennas uh, that all receive the same signal. Um, the signal is then meets at a single point and is correlated and, and creates a virtual uh, single dish antenna array uh, and antenna feed. And, and that's the reason for, for going for antenna arrays. Uh, there's lots of, um, uh, if, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, resilience in the system. Uh, you can subarray the antenna, so you can be looking at two objects. Some part of the array can be looking at one, some part of the other. Uh, and, and that's kind of the, the very simple case. This is a meerkat dish. Uh, 640 poles uh, make up the backing structure, and uh, in the order of 34 panels that go on top of that. Uh, that's the main sub-reflector. It's been carried out into the field. So those were manufactured off-site, assembled in a dish assembly set, a shed in the Karoo site. And we'll get to some Google Maps. You can see where this all is, uh, and a, a very impressive structure. Um, it is 20 meters high, all up weight of 42 tons. Uh, um, most of that, or a lot of that weight is in this uh, pedestal structure. This is a mini data center. It's a radio frequency shielded so that none of the uh, electrical charges or emissions come out and destroy the very weak signal that's coming from space that we're trying to listen to. And we spend a lot of time on managing radio frequency interference. It's, it's kind of key uh, value to, to the project. Um, so the, the, the main signal coming from space um, off this uh, sub-reflector, and then it uh, is onto a receiver. And then right at the back there is a digitizer. We go digital at the earliest possibility in the project. And from there, we stream uh, 40 gigs per second on, onto the correlator. So 64 antennas, 40 gigs per second, that's what hits the, the correlator. And those are small numbers compared to what's coming, I think, for SKA, uh, where they start using the X-band, uh, X-band, which has uh, uh, almost uh, four times that. And then 60 gig per second times 200 antennas. Uh, that's a bigger number to deal with. Um, this is the guy who does the cartoons for Madam and Eve. Um, uh, I needed this to understand how it worked. <laughs> I've explained that, but uh, what, what happens uh, here, the, the, the 16 receivers uh, send the uh, data to an underground data center that's on the site. Um, it's in a Faraday cage underground behind a hill and the earth that was taken out is put there to stop radio signals uh, interfering with the, with the telescope. Um, it's there where it's correlated and then it moves to a science data processor where it is then productized uh, and then it's uh, shipped um, on a long haul link uh, via San Ren to um, a, a 20 petabyte storage archive, which is based at the CHBC in Rosebank, Cape Town. Um, and then from that point, uh, it's distributed to the customers. Uh, there's also a control and monitoring system that controls the operational technology um, inside the telescope. Um, there are a lot of moving parts. These are directional dishes. Um, there's, there are multiple, there are four uh, receivers that can be used on each uh, disk. Um, so a lot of control that needs to happen. They need to be stowed in high wind conditions at 70 Ks an hour, we've got to stow them. Um, so lots of control elements. Uh, this is the control and monitoring uh, software uh, block diagram, just gives you some idea of what we do. Uh, that was all developed in house entirely. So it was built as part of the, uh, of the development uh, program, the hardware development was matched with the software control and monitoring systems that uh, were then deployed uh, to and, and, and have evolved from uh, CAT7 to through to Neocat um, and now going forward to SKA as well. A quick look at the correlator. This is it in our data center. So this is the underground data center in the, in the Karoo. Uh, there's 146 racks on the data center floor, this underground uh, room. 
Um, this uh, is a technology here called SCARAB. Um, it was designed and uh, programmed and produced in-house in, in Soro, uh, manufactured by Parallax, a company who's probably best known for their defense military uh, electronic warfare and countermeasures. Um, they helped uh, a little bit in the integration. Uh, but all of these together with their 40 each with a 40 gig input, receives the signal, does the cross correlation and then makes it available um, to the science data processor um, for that. Here's some of the stats. Um, uh, you, would, you would wonder how the, the, the 64 by 40 gig arise. Uh, they've created a CLOS network. Is it CLOS or CLO? I forget, named after Charles CLOS or CLO. Um, it's, it's a cheap way of doing a director class switch using, in this case, uh, 18 uh, spines and 36 leave switches. These are all uh, 30, uh, 48 port uh, 40 gig switches, and those are so times 18 times 36. And then uh, creating uh, the data products that then become available using multicast groups. Um, it's a very clever way. Uh, when I saw it, it came in from the networking side for customers downstream to, to subscribe to specific projects. So each, uh, products, each multicast group represents either a channel or a, a frequency or a, a, an output from the correlator that you can subscribe to and then continue the pipeline processing on. And, and then the total interest rate there, you see uh, 2.1 terabits. On the SDP side, um, so this receives the signal um, using those multicast group subscriptions. Um, it goes through an ingest phase, a calibration phase. Um, we use a, a, just a bunch of uh, Dell servers uh, pretty much do that using the, the Dell R730s, um, some fat nodes and some thin nodes. Um, all with a 40 gig interface uh, to, to interconnect the data. Um, uh, there is then also a continuing imaging. Uh, here we have um, 32 super micro boxes, each with four uh, 1080 Ti G GPUs in. So whatever that is, four times a lot of GPUs. <laughs> Good for uh, crypto mining. Um, shouldn't have said that, eh? I know you guys are all going to try and hack in. <laughs> sorry, sorry. I see my cybersecurity lead is here and he's shaking his head. <laughs> so why did you tell him that? <laughs> all right. And then uh, we have the object store. Um, this was an in-house development. It's a, a 48 bay um, a drive unit, uh, which was designed and manufactured again using Parallax from scratch. Uh, really, the objective there was to provide what the, the industry didn't have at the time, they do have now is just a, a, a standard a bunch of disks, um, each with a dedicated SATA channel to the, the CPU. Um, and on top of this, we uh, are deploying Ceph. So using Ceph as the object store, which runs on top. Ceph is an open store, uh, open source uh, object store, um, uh, not file system. That's all you need to say, object store. <laughs> All right, so looking at Google Maps, so you can go and look at this yourself on, on Google Maps. The, um, the data center I, I mentioned um, is sitting there. I can see this is a hill, it's a MESA. Um, the data center is in the ground underneath that. Uh, we've got a little airstrip. Uh, oh, there it is. Uh, we can land an aircraft there. That's at the largest PC-12, which we fly every week up to site. Um, and then this is the position of the 64 Meerkat antennas. And being a C programmer once, they start from zero. So it's M00 is the first one. I love it. And the last one is 63. It just aligns very well with my philosophies. <laughs> uh, this is the map of the spiral arms that will make up the SK-1 mid uh, frequency telescope. And what you're seeing there is that little patch in the, in the middle. And this is what it looks like from the air. And that's out in the Northern, Northern Cape, um, 100 kilometers uh, away from the town of Carnarvon. Here's some of the infrastructure on site. Uh, there are three big uh, rotary UPSs. Uh, we constructed a road uh, to the site with the Northern Cape uh, municipality. Uh, there's, this is the underground data center, um, the power generation units on the left and the data center, uh, sorry, on the right and the data center on the left. Uh, this is Martin and I working on the SDP side. And this is an example of a, a leaf node. So that's a leaf node in the, in the correlator. And there's uh, 18 plus 36 of those. So, a lot of cabling uh, to manage uh, that goes uh, goes on through there. 
Uh, we've also recently uh, added two hydrogen lasers. Uh, so the point of that is to provide a very accurate on-site uh, system clock. Um, you remember earlier I said that the radio frequency is digitized on the dish. That signal clock is distributed to all the antennas uh, because what we do when you digitize, we timestamp it so that that data can then pretty much arrive in order, out of order, and the correlator will then reassemble it based on the timestamps. So having this uh, at nanosecond level is, is key uh, for Meerkat. For SK-1, they're looking at picosecond um, timing. Uh, this was the launch. So our Deputy President, uh, David Mabuza, unfortunately, Cyril had to go to uh, Saudi Arabia to go and sort out some petrol for us at the time, so he couldn't make it. Uh, uh, but we, we did have the launch on the 13th of July. Um, and uh, at, at one of the, the antennas. And just a little statement there from uh, the Deputy President around the, the vision. Um, and really, this, this happens in all areas of HPC. We talk a lot about technology, but really, people are, are the key to this. Uh, that's what makes it happen. Okay, just a quick look at what we delivered. Uh, and there are a lot of papers that are available now on Meerkat, but this is probably the highlight. Uh, this got us a, a, a publication in, in Nature. Um, and, and these two images were, were published, uh, not, not the greatest of projectors. Uh, so there's the letter and, you know, easy way to get your name in, in nature. Uh, everyone who was part of the construction team on the first paper uh, gets, gets their name on the, on, the, on the first paper. So it's quite a long list of, uh, this is the constructors list, <laughs> which, is, uh, which is great. Um, Here's, here's an example of an image. This has been overlaid on, on the Meerkat space, uh, sort of a, a closer bit. But what you're looking at here is a view from Earth back to the center of our galaxy. So if, a bit of astronomy, there's lots of galaxies floating around the universe. They have spiraling arms that spiral around something heavy in the middle. And as they evolve, they get flatter and flatter and they become these spinning disks. Um, so radio frequency is not light. Uh, what you're seeing here is an intensity map uh, it's just showing the intensity of the of the signals in in a selected uh, band. But just look at the structures here. There's little bubbles. There's these uh, filaments of of matter, um, and and it's evident. And I'm not a scientist. I'm back to my disclaimer here. But the the incredible forces that are at the center of the galaxy are driving this strange structural behavior, which you can see in radio frequency. You cannot see in optical because there's so much dust and this sort of crap between us and them that you you just don't see it. This is a bit of uh, Galaxy 101. So we're here, uh, our solar system, um, and we're looking, the images at the center of that. Uh, from there to there is 25,000 light years. So quite close. Uh, but to put this in perspective, Voyager 1 and 2 were launched. Voyager 1 was launched in 1975. Um, that's 35 years ago. It is now only 20 light hours away from Earth. <laughs> it's just re recently got to the edge of our solar system to the heliosphere um, this this uh, this place just our galaxy is massive and then you look at hubble and you see millions and billions of galaxies this universe is massive uh, and this instrument is there to observe that are we doing on the time all right uh, Okay, so the project now is to improve Meerkat. We're adding 20 new dishes. Uh, this is in association with the Max Planck Institute and, uh, and INEF, the, the Italian group. Um, and, and really what we're doing there is now starting to test and prototype a new dish technology. Uh, there's a new correlator involved. Uh, the FPGA-based correlator will move to, I don't know if anyone was, yeah, the keynote uh, talk this morning about the challenge of CPU and GPU uh, contention. Um, this uh, is exactly the problem that we're facing in the correlator. Uh, here's an example of, of some of the technology that we're looking in the correlator. Uh, here's an example of one of the candidate architectures, uh, basically using a GPU and, and, and a, uh, a processor to, to do the correlation uh, with some 100 or 100 or 200 gig interfaces on that uh, and to scale that out. Um, the, the, the real constraint here is it's uh, memory bandwidth bound. Okay, thank you. Oh, there's some, some stats there on the correlator. So you'll have access to the, the presentation if you want to go into the details. Um, just adding additional dishes, which are, are, are sort of shown in the yellow. So we're starting to build out 
uh, the spiral arms from the central core that's in there. And that, that project is underway right now. Here's some of the activities. Uh, just have a look at this. Um, this is a foundation for the antenna. There can't be more than half a parsec uh, uh, movement in the entire structure. Uh, so these foundations are, there's, there's almost so much rebarring there that you can't even get the, the concrete in. Uh, you know, it, it is a solid structure. All right, so just finally moving on to the SKO. Um, it's an international project. South Africa is a member um, of, of this uh, project, as, as you may know. And, and South Africa's role in it is really to do a couple of things, is give over Meerkat as part of the starting radio telescope for this, and then to construct uh, an engineering office, science operations, and a data center that's gonna be based at Itemba Labs here in, in Cape Town. And I'll just get onto that quickly. Um, the Atemba Lab site, uh, if anyone's familiar with it, uh, this is where the cyclotron is uh, at Atemba Labs. This is Amazon's uh, DC3. There are three in Cape Town. This is their third one, the film studios. Uh, and we're going to build on this patch of land here. There's a new uh, city of Cape Town substation. Uh, there's another substation up there. Uh, our power requirements are only five megawatts at this point. Uh, when it was first pitched, it was going to be 30, but we've managed to improve that. Uh, and looking at also putting some local PV on the site uh, to support the local power generation. Uh, the role of regional centers is almost going to be uh, very critical in this, uh, because there's no point in having a radio instrument if the users and the scientists can't get to it. Uh, I believe there are only 200 people on the planet who can use radio astronomy data in anger. Uh, it's a very small market, but it's a huge amount of data. They're talking about an exa exabyte per year growth in the SK-1 requirement across the data center alliance. Um, so that's starting 2027. Um, very important part of my life uh, and, and a few of us here is the dark fiber project. So as part of this, the, uh, you can imagine 200 dishes transmitting 160 gig per second. There's a 20 terabits per second feed that needs to move from uh, the Karoo into Cape Town for processing. Uh, so I'm working with Ajay and his team at San Ren. Uh, we've uh, have an MOA uh, with them to uh, uh, construct this 180 kilometer route to join Carnarvon onto the national backbone at Beaufort West, uh, and then uh, allow us to have uh, high speed data connectivity. So there's, there's the route here. Uh, this is in the Northern Cape. There's the boundary of the Northern Cape and the Western Cape. And uh, we'll construct that route. Uh, hopefully starting construction next year. And then we get a little bit of a technical area where we have to go overhead through these passes. And then there's lots of uh, fiber routes back from Beaufort West. Meerkat National Park was uh, declared first national park since 2007 as a result of this project. Uh, so sand parks uh, will also be on site and managing the land area that's underneath the telescope, hopefully restoring some of the fauna and flora of the area, that's too small to, I don't want to get to the commercialization, but how are we doing? Yeah, okay, this projector is not going to do me any favors here, um, but there's a closed date of 2029 for the data center in, uh, in Cape Town. All right, so the opportunities. Um, you know, as I mentioned, there are a few things uh, that have been developed in-house. Uh, this digitizer that's on the back, that's completely designed and manufactured within Sorare. Uh, the storage uh, pods we talked about, the Scarab FPGA. Uh, this uh, clever passive radar system called Comrade, it uh, uses Radio Sonnegrenz's radio signal to detect uh, aircraft flying in the area. So passive radar, you're not transmitting anything, but you're getting the positions of objects in space. Uh, that was co-developed with us. Uh, projects including dense computing systems. This is Iron Hive. Uh, so this is a, uh, a racked um, like uh, you would have in a beehive. Uh, this is all uh, system on chip boards, uh, then dunked into a tank of oil. Um, and literally that is your data center. You can put that in the field somewhere and give it power and, a, and a, a cooling loop and off you go. No need for an expensive data center and petascale systems available. Um, I'll skip through that one. Um, the collaboration with Solo, and you'll see Solo are, are, are providing some of the uh, prize money for the student cluster competition. This is a project that uh, was spin off from Soreo to uh, look at commercializing some of the intellectual property that was developed uh, in, in uh, uh, Soreo. 
and Soraya has a uh, vested interest in the further development of that technology uh, through Tolo, who are the commercial company. Similarly, Tolo Blue, uh, looking at uh, providing object-based object, uh, object -based or S3-based interfaces to tape library or archive storage systems, uh, another key project uh, with Soraya and, and jointly with, um, with Tolo. So uh, Adrian asked me to put this slide up, uh, and I also believe this is very important. Uh, all of these infrastructures and, and really making data available to the science community is hugely important. You can have all the technology and hardware in the world, but if you haven't got a user interface, a federated method for authenticating and, uh, uh, and providing data uh, with uh, surety under the FAIR principles, um, you know, it, it kind of makes the, the, the point of these large instruments you know, uh, invalid. So it's key, and I think going forward that, that uh, we focus on this uh, South African Open Science uh, initiative and policies um, to better uh, support that. Uh, some of our, a uh, lot of human capital development and postgrad uh, events that we're doing. So like many parts of government, we are providing uh, training, graduate training, uh, and human capital development, a large part of the budget uh, being part of the NRF uh, goes towards there. And, you know, there's a lot of opportunities to come and join us. I mentioned all the technical areas that we're involved in. There are a lot of uh, uh, opportunities. Please have a look at our, our websites and, and see what you can do. And, of course, uh, social media. You can follow us on Twitter and LinkedIn and Instagram and Facebook. And our comms department are, are working uh, closely with us to get you that information. So in a nutshell, very quickly, that is my story. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Jeremy. So thank you for clapping for him before I requested you to. <laughs> okay, are there any questions? Anyone with a quick or quick one or two questions? Okay. Uh -oh. It's always extremely interesting to see what the SKA is up to. Um, just one thing, I, it's maybe a bit of a technical thing, but I, I just noticed on the one picture you showed of the new correlator development, you guys are using consumer class GPUs. Is that just for development or are you planning to actually deploy those? It's uh, There's no requirement for 64-bit uh, GPU. So if there's a way to to get the lower class at a, at a better price, it's going to be a trade-off. At the end of the day, uh, power consumption, uh, acquisition cost, uh, and actually meeting the, the requirements. And the requirements are only for 32-bit um, in, in Miaka Plus. SK goes to 64-bit, so that they will have no choice there. Thanks. Yeah, but if you, can, if you can do it cheaper, why not? Uh, hi, Jeremy. So my question also relates to the GPUs. Over the life of this thing, certainly some of them are going to die. Hmm. Do you buy a lot now? Sorry. Do you buy a lot now and you keep them in stock or do you have a replacement plan for them in future? Yeah, a, a bit of both. So uh, an inherent resilience within the system. Um, so we're trying to work to the area where you can have a rack level failure. So a, a node within a rack can fail completely and the whole thing continues working. And then also failure within the box. So there's four GPUs who you'll, uh, you can maybe lose two. It's just a trade off. How long do you keep it running before you decide to pull it out of the system? But because it's a pipeline and it's configured at runtime, the, the, the entire using DevOps process uh, and the deployment on the CAM radio, as you start an observation, it's a bare metal backend system and you, you deploy it from scratch. So you just, if something's not working, you just don't include it in the builds list. Uh, so that's the way around. And then of course, logistics, uh, we do a lot of, on the engineering side, we do FMIC analysis. We look at the failure modes and decide what we hold in spares. Um, yeah. I hope that answers the question. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. And let's give him a round of applause again. Thank you.